Thanks for joining us today. I'm Pastor Josh Barnes. This is Justin Barnes and Jonathan Barnes, and we are all Barneses. And this is the show where we're unashamed to look at political, social, cultural, and theological issues from a biblical worldview. And we do that because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, and that proves that, G that the Bible's true, because Jesus said so. And if the Bible's true, we can't be right about issues if we disagree with the Bible. Now, today we have a fun one. We're going to talk about uh, atheist arguments, which, you know, pop atheism is... <laughs> rather easy it's it's a little bit low-hanging fruit but it's also i think really necessary that we we respond to it so we're going to do a little bit of that today we try not to do a lot of that just because it's so easy we try to get into you know actual difficult hard hard to wrap our heads around questions but i thought this one was going to be easy um uh welcome back to the show justin i called jonathan justin in the last show so i want to uh, officially apologize to you justin about that um <laughs> <laughs> Not so much to Jonathan, um, but uh, here is our here is our topic for today, um, and I'll just put it up here on the screen. It's the atheists, theists wheel of excuses. So this is um, comes to you from a scary Bible quote of the day. Basically, it's it's people who who deny the Bible, um, but like to laugh at it and and mock uh, theists, and their theists wheel of excuses uh, lists eight excuses that they say that theists use um, all the time to sort of excuse their bad logic is the assumption that goes without being said. Um, we'll get into each one of these in just a moment. Before we do, um, your opening thoughts, uh, Jonathan, because Justin will take all the time for the re that we have for the day if I, if I let Justin start. <laughs> Jonathan, You've, you've talked to an atheist before. Have you ever seen one of those guys before? Those, they call themselves atheists. Um, it's been a while, but yeah. Um, a quick <laughs> a quick glance around this wheel, I guess, kind of looks like it is a bunch of excuses as to why the atheists aren't really researching out the Bible themselves. I mean, it, it's what it kind of strikes me as from the, from, from the beginning, I guess. Yeah, you know, it, it um, actually takes thought applied to the Bible. And it seems like from this wheel, just on on its face, uh, it, the face of the wheel, that um, the 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 atheist is against anyone actually thinking about a Bible passage or about an argument against the Bible. If an argument is brought against the Bible, then surely you're not allowed to think about the argument. You're just supposed to accept it and then deny the Bible. Um, you know that's that should be obvious, right, Justin? Well, yeah, I mean, what we're fundamentally dealing with here is a pop atheist argument that's geared towards pop Christian arguments. Because there are people who haven't done any time looking into apologetics, haven't really done any work themselves in any study. And so this kind of argument um, is compelling when targeting people who it is their go-to is like, well, you can't prove it didn't happen. Or, well, if you have faith, it makes sense. Like, that's what they're trying to target and feast on and prey upon is uninformed Christians. So we're talking pop atheism versus pop Christianity here. Right. Yeah. And we're going to try to bring some common sense and careful thinking. Uh, we've said before that all, that there's a lot of proof, like an abundance of proof for the truth of the Bible. Um, but I would say that the chief proof is the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And if you disagree, you can go check out some of those videos and um, be proven wrong. All right, uh, we've, we've done videos on, on the subject, but let's get into some of these arguments. Let's, we'll do them one by one here. Um, pull them back up on the screen for you. Uh, here we go. Let's start with that one. You can't prove it didn't happen. So um, an atheist brings up an argument against the Bible. The Christian says, you can't prove that that didn't happen. Um, first of all, I mean, my first thought with that argument is, well, that, that might be a good introductory argument before you get into deeper arguments. But, but it is true that, um, that atheists who want to try to prove the Bible false can't prove that these things didn't happen. Um, and, and that's one of the things about history. When we're studying history, um, you know, I'm thinking of a few, a few examples. One of the things that the first thing an atheist likes to bring up with me is, do you believe a donkey can talk? And I think, well, first of all, I do think that if there is a creator God who created donkeys, he could certainly give them the ability to talk. I think that's a lesser miracle than the creation. So let's go to the creation, right? Um, 
and and that's that's a situation where I think it's fair to use the phrase in my arguments that they certainly can't prove that the creator didn't do this thing. Um, what are you, what are your thoughts? Well, I I would just say that really in most circumstances where this would be something that I might consider saying because like you said, this is an introductory thing to say. Well, you can't prove it didn't happen. That's how you that's how you start off. That's not like your full argument. At least it shouldn't be. Um, but in any circumstance where an atheist would would probably be met with that, it's actually a place where I have more reason to be skeptical about it than they do. Because my worldview says that there is a governing governing principle. There's a God who has set laws for the universe by which the universe is governed, whereas they believe nothing came into nothing created existence, non-life created life. And they're everything we know. Apparently, all the rules were broken at one point, so they have to be able to be broken again. So I have a reason to be skeptical when I hear a donkey talk. They don't because they believe evolved fish are now talking. There, yeah. there's, there's a reason for me to be more skeptical because I have the God of the Bible. But because I have the God of the Bible, I believe it. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, um, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of vague. It's, it's hard to, you know, without some sort of an example, like like you gave, it's it's hard to kind of put this into context. But uh, and <laughs> that's one of the things on the wheel, I guess, is the context. <laughs> but um, yeah, like if you, if you take something like, well, you know, a whale couldn't swallow somebody and, and the person live and everything. Look, if we have a, an account of something. Um, I, it's, it feels to me like the whole, you can't prove it didn't happen would only be a response to, well, this definitely didn't happen because it can't happen. Well, we have an account in the Bible, uh, of something happening. And we, we also believe in an all powerful God. Um, you just saying it, it can't happen does not, does not really do anything for your argument. So you can't prove it didn't happen while well, it's, it's not a great argument on its own. It, it does have some legs against, you know, the atheist argument of, well, it just, it, there's no way it happened. Yeah. You know? I think it's right. I think, I right. don't it, think you, you certainly shouldn't just say, you know, oh, you can't prove it didn't happen and then walk away. Right. If you're going to say that, you've got to go into, into more detail. But the fact of the matter is we don't have to prove every detail of the Bible to prove the Bible as a whole. Right. We have, we have prophecy that was that was prophet we can prove was prophesied hundreds of years before it was very specifically fulfilled it was not self-fulfilling prophecy it fulfilled exactly in a time scale when it was supposed to have all these types of things um the, the destruction of tyre the the coming of christ in in 30 33 ad like all of these things we have a lot of evidence for the bible as a whole we don't have to then go through and prove each little detail because we can make each book credible we can show that each book is credible we can show that the entirety as a whole is, fr is from the, a creator god and so so each detail doesn't have to be dealt with um, specifically i think yeah and ultimately they're assuming what jonathan was pointing out there is they're assuming their worldview into the conversation so they don't feel like they have to prove that the donkey didn't talk even though we've got we have positive evidence of some sort that the donkey talked just to use that example in that there's an account of it in a historical document so we have some form of positive evidence and they're just saying well because my worldview is true which is the entire discussion we're having but because my worldview is true it didn't happen yeah we have they're we have, assuming we have evidence they're correct of it. before they're, they're begging the question yeah we have evidence of it in a document that is otherwise and everything everything that we can prove is actually accurate you know when we look at the 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 peoples of the time the the wars that take place in the, the book of judges and, and so on and so forth actually that wasn't the book of judges that was the book of deuteronomy um so uh or numbers even actually probably uh but the, the other details around that are actually all correct and actually all proven to be true and so we have reason to to believe that you know the the story even that the same author wrote of 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 genesis um, and, and creation is it, we can prove to be true that we know that there has to be a creator God so on and so forth so um, yeah so then all the details that he wrote it's very reasonable to assume that those were accurate details next one it's a translation issue Justin is our translation uh, expert Justin I'm gonna let you uh, start with this one I mean I just think that this one this is one they're really hoping you don't think about uh, 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 really a lot of these are things they're hoping you don't think about because 
what's your suggestion that there's no such thing as translation issues? Um, like, for example, when we have a discussion about what was Paul talking about when he says arsenokoites, that's a translation issue. We need to accurately understand the term. What's so if I, I really don't get how this is an excuse, like saying we need to accurately understand what the word meant when the author wrote it uh, and translate it accurately. How is that yeah, because an excuse? Tr because I'm translation, I, I think some people don't understand. The translation is not as easy as, as it sounds. I think some people think, uh, oh, it's like I, I look on Google and say, hey, what is the Greek word for love? Boom. Okay. That translation. I just did translation. That It's way more complicated than that because from one language to another, there are different priorities in each language. For instance, English, uh, for us in the Western world, we don't really have as much of a priority on love as did the, the Greeks. The Greeks had many, many words for love that expressed different kinds of love. We don't. We have love. That's why, you know, it's hard for me to tell Justin, I love you, because it's the same word I use for my wife. You know, it's, it's got a little weird, okay? So I say, yeah, I kind of love you, man. Like, I got to be careful with how I say it because it sounds weird, right? In Greek, you didn't, you had different words for it because there was different things, right? <laughs> so when you're translating, a translator then not only has to just say one word equals this, they have to actually find a way to express the meaning. And it can be very, very difficult. And there are absolutely translation issues. It's nonsense to say that there aren't. Right, right. And it's not only that, that's just layer one of the problem. Layer two is there's something called semantic domain. So words like, for example, logos in the ancient world in Greek had a humongous semantic domain, which means it meant a lot of different stuff. And it was dependent on the context, on uh, context, on the syntax, on the, the tense it was in, on the surrounding context that that's around the word. Like there is so much that goes into translation that to suggest that it's just automatically an excuse to say there's a translation issue we need to work through is bizarre because even their most, even their biggest atheist people they're going to appeal to, guys like Bart Ehrman, are all about the translation issues and the textual history and all of that kind of stuff. So this was just weird. Yeah, Jonathan, it sounds to me like that they're they're afraid of these arguments. Like when an atheist brings a pop atheist brings up an argument to a Christian, and a Christian say, "Well, okay, let me show you how this is a translation issue." The pop atheist is afraid because they don't know what to do about that. They had never actually studied the original um, manuscripts, so they don't really know their subject. Yeah, it, it seems like something that like meme atheism would 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 get right. Let me throw out one word or one one liner and just say oh you're just saying it's a translation issue i mean it, it's really about what you back that up with if you're the christian um if you say well it's a translation issue and let me show you why and you can walk through and say here's what the what the original word was here's what it means here's 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 how it's being used right here um which is why your interpretation of it is incorrect atheist and then the atheist is like oh you're just saying an excuse Come on, I mean, come on. Can we be intelligent about this? Yeah. Um, the, the whole the whole one liner thing where I I got you. you you're just saying it's a translation issue. That's pretty pathetic. I mean, yeah. if you can and back by the it way, up and, and show me in the text, then then what's the problem with it? <laughs> right. And where does this normally come up when an atheist looks through sixty different translations to find the one that words the verse the way he wants to attack the Bible on and uses <laughs> that one? Yeah. That's right. They do that all the time. <laughs> Oh my goodness, well, all the passion. It's like, yeah, I don't use the New Living Translation. Uh, that's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. So how about we actually look yeah. at the Greek? In fact, it's yeah. usually they'll go to the paraphrase versions and say, hey, this is what your Bible says. No, that's a, no. that's somebody's commentary, basically. They, that's why I go to the Greek. Oh, sorry, so that's funny my excuse. When they try to tell me what I believe and then try to argue against the straw man that they're telling me I believe. When I say, yeah. that's not what I believe. <laughs> yeah. All right, we've got to move on. Let's do the next one. That's how things were back then. I'm going to add the word back because it makes more sense. That's how things were back then. Now, um, I can see how this could be used wrongly by Christians, but also how it could be. I mean, obviously, you need to know the cultural context. That's super important. Like, that's one of the main things that even any Bible students today, huge thing they miss the cultural context of, of passages, like even even in the uh, the prodigal son, 
you know, the context of that, there was a big deal about the famine because he wasn't, God didn't rescue him out of famine. He, he allowed him to go through famine, right? And he was poor in the middle of famine. God didn't preserve him and save him. Like that was a big deal. We don't get that because we don't think about famine. It's just not part of our culture, right? We, we don't have to deal with it. We haven't had to deal with famine in our lifetimes. Um, so that's how things were back then is a really important part of studying the scripture. But I do think it can be used like wrongly, right? So if an atheist says, well, look, your Bible says that women can't be pastors. And you say, well, that's just how things were back then. Today, women can be pastors. Um, I think that would be a wrong use of that argument. I'm letting Jonathan go first. Yeah. <laughs> just a lot to say this one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like all of these, to some extent, are. What do you back this up with? I mean, if it, on on a on a on a surface level, they can be used in a right way and a wrong way. Um, like you said, the historical context is important to a lot of scripture. I think uh, this might be another one where, if you have if you have an example of where an atheist would use this, probably when you're talking about the Old Testament, and they're like, well. Why does the Bible say that you can do this, that, and the other? And and if if a Christian is just going to say, well, that's how things were then, um, let, let's let's add some, let's add some more stuff to that. There, there's there's a historical context that we should know. I mean, this kind of goes hand in hand with what what atheists and really liberals do, um, anyways. They, they they take they like to take historical context out of everything, and they like to say, well, everything everything up until this point is horrible and wrong and bad. And, you know, everybody was racist and everybody was this, that, and the other. And they don't let anybody exist within their own timeline. So if if somebody's going to rebut that and say, well, things are a little bit different. Oh, you're just saying that, that the excuse, that's how yeah. things were then. I mean, it kind of it kind of flows into that mentality as, as well, I think. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And I think a lot of this comes down to, I mean, what what are you saying when you say this is an excuse? Are you saying that we shouldn't take into account the way that people thought and operated in the ancient world? Read, read the book, Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. You'll learn a lot about how people thought back Great then. Book. That is vital to how you interpret the Bible. They didn't think in the same linear, necessarily, way they did. They sort of grouped things together. They didn't see it as a, as, um, you know, a problem to group certain stories together. To, in order to make a point, they weren't making a contradiction. That's just how they thought we're taking a Western approach. So there is something to the idea that you have to think how they thought if you want to understand what they wrote. This is not a modern book, and you can't just treat it like it is. But to be fair, a lot of times, like, I think this one probably is, by your average Christian, used excuse more than anything. Yeah, sadly. I think we're going to, because for a second time, just really brush over this next one. It, it makes sense if you have faith. I agree that this is this is a, an excuse that's a bad excuse for from Christians. Faith is not the evidence for, um, for, for faith is the result of evidence. Okay, faith is not an argument. It's the result of argumentation. You, you've, you've looked at the evidence and you've come to a decision and now you believe something, right? And that's faith. Um, now, seeing what others have come, other conclusions that others have come to, others people's faith, can be evidence for you. Okay, my parents looked at this and they came to this conclusion. That's good evidence for me to think that that's probably right. But it's not the only evidence I need, right? So you can use faith as an argument, but not your own faith, right? So it, it makes sense if you have faith, is, I think is a bad argument. Although I will say it's a bad argument for atheists too, that uh, life can come from non-living materials and we can overthrow the conservation of of energy Good and point. how energy yeah. and matter can't come from anything but hey it makes sense if you have faith right <laughs> right <laughs> all right i'm gonna try to read this one upside down because it's written upside down you are quoting out of context now this seems like a really reasonable answer to a alleged problem in any text of anything right um, this is what historians do. They, they want to not just quote something, but quote it in context. Um, how could that, I mean, I guess it could be used wrongly, I suppose, when it's not being quoted out of context, but it's always good to look at the context. Yeah, so if this is something you're putting up as a shield to save you from having to embrace what the Bible is actually saying on something, like if you're, if somebody's accusing you of, 
uh, the Bible of being homophobic and you're a Christian who's affirming and you say, oh, you're just quoting it out of context. Well, OK, you're just using an excuse. However, context is a thing. And it's not just a thing for Bible people. It's a thing for literally everyone any, everywhere. If your wife comes up to you and says, kill them, we need to know what the context is. Are we talking spiders or the neighbors? <laughs> this is kind of important. <laughs> context matters. So I, again, we, we did my, a whole, my question... We did a whole episode on verses is, that are taken out of What's the alternative? Yeah, my, my question is, what's yeah. the alternative? What would you rather me do? Say, you know what? Context doesn't matter. Yeah, then you can make it mean whatever you want it to mean. You know, we, we, we did a whole, whole episode on this where we, we went through verses that, you know, um, you know, like um, like uh, I would that thou art hot or cold, you know, in, in Revelation. You know, that obviously doesn't mean that I want you to be hot on fire for God or cold, you know, indifferent to God. It doesn't mean that. It, you have to look at the context, the cultural context. Uh, same thing for Matthew 18, you know, the where two or three are gathered. We have to look at the context to see what he's talking about there. Like that's how anything, any type of communication has to be. It, it means nothing if you, do, if you don't take into account the context, nothing at all. Yeah, there, there's, there's historical context, which we already covered. And then there's the context of the text around what verse you're reading or what, what passage you're reading. I mean, let's, let's take this to its logical conclusion. I mean, you look at the, the story of Abraham and Isaac um, and, and God tells Abraham to go kill Isaac. Does that mean... Every parent should go kill their their child. No, that's not the context of what we're talking about. And you could go to any passage you want and rip anything out, out you want and make it mean it whatever you want. Keeping it in its context is incredibly important when you're reading the Bible and when you're understanding it. Why would you not be able to, if someone takes it out of context, that, that it sounds like it'd be pretty easy of a dispute or, or a refutation to say, no, yeah. you got you got to make sure you read. It sounds what's like if, it. if an atheist did get this argument and it was wrong, then they could just go to the context and show, no, I'm not taking it out of context. But it sounds like they can't do that, and they, that bothers them. And and by the way, real quick, I bet you an atheist wants to be kept in context when he speaks and when he writes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Everyone does. Everyone does. Um, all right, let's let's just for sake of time, let's. Um, I th I'm thinking that you are reading it wrong. Really goes really well with you're taking it out of context. Um, so, yes, people can read things wrong, and it's fair to look and say, "Are you reading it right? Is that actually what it means?" So I don't. That's nonsense. That's not an excuse at all. Uh, as long as it's followed by, "Let's look and see what it actually means." Okay, and and fairly uh, based on actual evidence. So let's do these two together. It's a metaphor, and it is not for us to know. Um, are these um, are these good arguments? It's not for us to know. I suppose I'm thinking myself that there are some scenarios, um, you know, like in a, that you know some things that aren't for us to know. Like you know, well, you know how how many demons uh, can fit into one man if it takes two thousand pigs to hold them all? You know, like. Okay, that's probably not for us to know, you know, but that's not the type of things that atheists are really bringing against us anyway. So I don't see when a Christian would actually use that argument uh, with an atheist. Yeah, that's one that I don't. Uh, there are things that we don't know the mind of God. So there's things that God has revealed and things he hasn't. And I'm perfectly happy to stop speaking when God stops speaking. So there are things that are not for us to know. I just don't see how it's apologetically relevant. Usually. But we can prove the Bible. We don't need those things to prove the Bible. There's I mean, no, no proof okay, for so the Bible it, that we're not supposed to know. Unless we're talking about okay. like, okay, why did God let that hurricane kill all the kids in the orphanage? Okay, that's not for us. We don't know the mind of God. We don't know why he did that, except for for his glory. He yeah, will we know, work we know that for much. his glory in the end. Yeah. Right. Um, and then it's a metaphor. I'll, I'll shoot this one over to you first, Jonathan, mm -hmm. in case you also had something you wanted to say on the previous one. It's a metaphor. Like, oh, yeah, no, but that's just a metaphor. I mean, there are some obvious metaphors in the Bible, right? I mean, like, how, yeah. how could there not be, right? <laughs> right. Well, we will, when we look at the Bible, and it's obviously metaphor by the words that it's using, or we're, we're looking at, you know. Does the mountain um, skip like rams? Oh, like, tree. obviously, that's metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> Or I believe in, in Psalms, it was um, something about David and a, and a bed of tears and flowing. And it's like, yeah. um, and he's flooding everything. I mean, come, did he actually do that? I, I don't think so. That, that 
that sounds like a metaphor to me. You got to give the authors some sort of leniency to use the terminology that was being used in that day or to, you know, just, you know, we use metaphors in our speak all the time. Uh, we don't even realize it. Um, it just, just me even saying all the time is, is kind of like a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's not really all the time. Yeah. Uh, but um, I don't have a so, dog in that fight. Right. I mean, it's a metaphor. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so metaphorical speaking. Yeah. You can use that wrong, too, and just say, well, I, I don't know. So it's a metaphor. It's same same thing with it's not for us to know. Maybe instead of saying stuff like that, if you don't know the answer to what they're saying, be honest with the atheist and say, look, I don't know the answer. I, I, I'm, I do think there is an answer, but I, I don't know. So instead of throwing one of these out into the middle of the, the abyss and just saying, well, it's got to be a metaphor. Uh, it's not for us to know. It, it, it might not be a metaphor. It might be for us to yeah. know. And you just don't know. Maybe be a little bit more discerning with that and say, hey, I, I don't know. We should be prepared to give an answer. But sometimes maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get a question that we don't know the answer to. Just admit, hey, I don't know. I'll, I'll try to find an answer for you. How about we just do that instead? That's good. Justin? Yeah, so it's, again, I just have to say, it's amazing that atheists don't allow the Bible to have different literary types that every every other work of art in human history has. There's whole books of poetry in the Bible, and there's different literary techniques. There's hyperbole, there's metaphor, there's analogy. There's all that sort of, all the same kind of writing techniques we have today existed in the bible so why do we say that it's not allowed in the bible like jonathan was talking about david says that he cried so much that his bed started swimming are we are we really under the impression that the author expected us to believe that david was in tears so much he cried so much that the room filled up with water his bed became alive and began swimming around the room no of course not what brain dead person would think that like why are you incapable of being fair with what you're seeing if you're going to argue that it is just an excuse to say it's metaphor when god says that he's on a throne and the earth is his footstool um when when we're obviously not talking about the earth as a literal footstool and god literally on a throne in space with his feet on earth like i I, again i just I, i can't get around why they're so unfair well and this strikes me as something that scary bible quote of the day on facebook probably encounters a lot (laughs) they probably post a lot of verses that out of context um seem ridiculous that are actual metaphors right um job psalms proverbs things like that put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite you know like okay that's a metaphor (laughs) don't actually do that but you should stop being well it's it's hyperbole actually but hyperbole but yeah that's true but the point is when you're when this is what you do on Facebook is post Bible quotes out of context, you should expect these type of of comments in your comment section and making up a theist wheel of excuses to try to make fun of people who are giving you actual responses is, well, it's nonsense. That's all the time we have for today. We'll see you next time on Point of View. <laughs>